Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news in Israel, so if you haven't had the time to stay on top of what's what in the Holy Land with ILTV, have no worries. It's time for our new show this week in Israel where we'll give you the scoop on everything you need to know about the last seven days right from Tel Aviv. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here to keep you informed. Following their first face-to-face -face meeting at the White House, both U.S. President Donald Trump and Palestinian Authority leader Mahmoud Abbas are expressing optimism over resuming the peace process with Israel. Trump says he's committed to reaching an accord and claims peace can be achieved under his guidance. I welcome President Abbas here today as a demonstration of that partnership, that very special partnership that we all need to make it all work. And I look forward to welcoming him back as a great mark of progress and ultimately toward the signing of a document with the Israelis and with Israel toward peace. We want to create peace between Israel and the Palestinians. We will get it done. While speaking through a translator, Abbas reiterated his call for a two-state solution. <laughs> سيادة الرئيس الاستراتيجي الوحيد هو أن نحقق مبدأ الدولتين دولة فلسطين بعاصمتها القدس الشرقية لتعيش بأمن وسلام واستقرار إلى جانب دولة إسرائيل على حدود 1967 Trump told Abbas there can be no lasting peace unless the Palestinian leaders speak in a unified voice against incitement to violence and hate, which Israel considers a major obstacle to achieving a settlement. Trump also called on the PA leader to not only combat terrorism, but resolve the provision of payments to the families of Palestinians who have attacked or killed Israelis. Abbas responded by insisting the Palestinians are raising their children in a culture of peace, and thanked Trump for his efforts. Now, Mr. President, with you, we have hope. We'll start a process which hopefully will lead to peace. Uh, over the course of my lifetime, I've always heard that perhaps the toughest deal to make is the deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Let's see if we can prove them wrong, okay? Over a later lunch meeting, the American president said he really doesn't think it's going to be all that hard to attain a peace deal. It's a, uh, something that I think is, frankly, uh, maybe not as difficult as people have thought over the years, but we need two willing parties. We believe Israel is willing. We believe you're willing. And if you both are willing, we're going to make a deal. After leaving the White House, the Palestinian president told a large delegation of American Jewish leaders that even though no exact mechanism have yet been discussed, he's now hopeful that peace negotiations with Israel can be resumed. While some analysts believe U.S. President Donald Trump's push for peace with Israel may have just handed Mahmoud Abbas a political lifeline in the Palestinian Authority, the Hamas terrorist leaders of Gaza are making it clear that they won't be a part of it. They're totally denying that Mahmoud Abbas has any authority to negotiate on behalf of the Palestinians. Hamas spokesman Sami Abu Zuri issued rapid-fire comments on Twitter, denouncing the PA president's statement that all final status issues are solvable, because Hamas insists that national rights belong to all Palestinians and no one person can relinquish them. The latest Hamas policy document states that the Islamists are willing to accept a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, but it unequivocally opposes the existence of any Jewish state within the pre-1967 lines and denounces Israel as being an illegal entity. Hamas has held tenuous relations with Abbas ever since it seized the Gaza Strip from the Palestinian Authority in a bloody 2007 war. Just yesterday, a senior PA official declared that Abbas is no longer willing to finance that coup. The head of Ramallah's Civil Affairs Department has publicly stated that the PA is intending to dry up the flow of funds to the territory's Hamas rulers by ending all payments for electricity in the power-starved Gaza Strip. Now, will the United States actually move its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? There may be more of an answer now to this big, big question. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence is speaking out. Pence has taken Israeli Independence Day as an opportunity to show the USA support for the state of Israel. So let me say with confidence to all who are gathered here, President Trump 
stands without apology for Israel, and he always will. That support apparently comes with fulfilling President Donald Trump's most controversial campaign vow. And the President of the United States, as we speak, is giving serious consideration to moving the American Embassy in Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But Vice President Pence says moving the embassy does not mean that the U.S. President is shying away from tackling the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And to be clear, the President is also personally committed to resolving the Israeli and Palestinian conflict. Even now, we're making valuable progress toward the noble goal of peace. Thanks to the President's tireless leadership, momentum is building and goodwill is growing. And that while there will undoubtedly have to be compromises, you can rest assured, President Donald Trump will never compromise the safety and security of the Jewish state of Israel. Not now, not ever. Israelis are anxiously waiting to hear what comes out of today's meeting between the U.S. leader and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, who will be visiting the White House for the first time since Trump has taken office. Lawmakers in Israel are outraged by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization for passing a resolution which claims that Israel has no legal or historical claims anywhere in Jerusalem. The vote took place on Israel's Independence Day and passed with 22 countries in favor, 10 opposed and 23 abstaining. The document is apparently aiming to safeguard the cultural heritage of Palestine by reaffirming that all legal and administrative decisions made by Israel regarding Jerusalem are so-called void. Israeli officials from across a political spectrum are now blasting UNESCO and its resolution as both anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. And UNESCO said a year ago that we have no uh, connection to the Temple Mount. This year, they didn't say that. That's an improvement in the march of absurdity. Uh, they also uh, said that Judaism, too, has some connection to Jerusalem. Well, we're making progress. Uh, but there's still a way to go. And the way we have to go is, in fact, to cut out this nonsense. The Israeli Prime Minister is now vowing to make sure that UNESCO does not carry out any more votes on Israel. There are more countries today that are abstaining uh, or supporting Israel than there are those opposing Israel. But my goal is to have no votes in UNESCO and Israel. Israel regards Jerusalem as its indivisible capital, including its predominantly Arab eastern side. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which includes the Western Wall, is the site of two biblical Jewish temples and is considered the most sacred site in Judaism. Yet that very site is also home to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holiest place in Islam, and has been a flashpoint of violence in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel therefore bars Jewish prayer at the holy site as part of a long-standing arrangement to avoid security concerns and adhere to religious and political sensitivities. The Israeli ambassador to UNESCO says that the organization shouldn't be involved in the matter at all. There is no need that UNESCO will be involved in any political issue. The place for political issues and for conflicts is in the UN in New York. And the Arab group and the Palestinians should go to there and leave UNESCO to deal with its mandate. Its mandate is about other stories, just positive one. And we offered more than one time to the Palestinians and to, ad, to other neighbors of us. Let's do some positive projects together. Let's do something that can build trust, a minimum of trust. But unfortunately, there is no answer from the other side. Train service across the state of Israel is being increased this Memorial Day to help at least one and a half million mourners reach ceremonies and cemeteries to remember those lost. The entire nation stood in silence as a siren rang out for two full minutes at 11 o'clock this morning. 24-hour memorial candles are being lighted in almost every home. 23,554 men and women have been killed since 1860 while serving in defense of the country or the pre-state Jewish community. Official commemorations began last night and a separate state ceremony is being held at the National Military Cemetery on Mount Herzl this afternoon in tribute to the 3,117 people murdered during terror attacks. When the sun finally sets this evening, sadness will turn to joy as the nation begins celebration of the 69th year of Israeli independence. 
happy birthday, Israel. Yesterday marked Israel's 69th Independence Day, and let's just say Israelis know how to celebrate. Let's take a look at what was happening in the Holy Land for this special holiday. As Israel commemorates the end of Memorial Day and the beginning of Independence Day, you may not realize it, but May 1st also marks the start of Jewish Heritage Month in the United States. Every, pe every presidential administration since 2006 has issued annual proclamations for nationwide tributes in May honoring Jewish contributions to the United States. While announcing the event, President Donald Trump says American Jews have stood at the forefront of the struggles for human freedom, equality and dignity in every aspect of the country's cultural, spiritual, economic and civic life, while helping to shine a light of hope to people around the globe. He added that the indelible mark Jewish people have left on American culture is today manifested in the towering success they've achieved through a unique synthesis of respect for their heritage and love of country. While expressing the nation's gratitude for this great strong and prosperous and loving people, the president underscored the deep spiritual connection that binds and will always bind the Jewish people to the United States and its founding principles. Trump says he'll be celebrating Jewish Heritage Month with his daughter Ivanka, who's converted to Judaism and lives an observant Jewish life with her husband and presidential advisor Jared Kushner and their children. There were some major clashes between Palestinians and Israeli security forces over the weekend in both the West Bank and Jerusalem. The violence came after Palestinian political parties declared a day of rage to demonstrate solidarity with hunger striking prisoners in Israeli jails. Protesters hurled rocks at passing Israeli cars on a public road near one prison outside of Jerusalem. Soldiers in military jeeps fired stun grenades and tear gas after they also came under attack. A large number of Palestinian youth took to the streets of Bethlehem. They threw rocks at Israeli soldiers stationed by the border fence who also responded with non-lethal crowd dispersal tactics. No casualties were reported during any of the widespread protests. Women and children gathered outside of the Dome of the Rock Mosque in Jerusalem's Old City and they chanted Allahu Akbar and other slogans of support while waving some of the prisoners' photographs. The open-ended hunger strike was launched on April 16th by convicted terrorist Melwan Balguti. The Palestinians say they're striking against poor conditions conditions and the Israeli policy of detention without trial. But Israeli officials believe the move is a politically motivated show of support for Balguti, who is the main rival of PA President Mahmoud Abbas. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas is in Cairo for high-level talks with the Egyptian president, where the two leaders are expected to coordinate their positions on the peace process before Abbas meets with President Trump next week. ILTV's Aaron Porras returns with more. Now, Aaron, what do you think that they're going to be talking about? Well, I think all the details will obviously be kept semi-close to the vest between Abbas and Sisi. But what we do know is that al-Sisi is a pretty big fan and a proponent of the Arab Peace Initiative that was presented in 2002. And I have just a few you know, excerpts from it. It's, it involves a complete withdrawal from the occupied territories, including uh, everything beyond 1948 border and the Syrian Golan. Establishment of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza with East Jerusalem as its capital. And in return, the Arab states would supposedly consider the conflict over and sign a peace agreement. Let's go to my report. I'll Let's tell you more. your report. Trump has made Middle East peacemaking a foreign policy priority, sending his envoy Jason Greenblatt twice to the region to meet with Israeli and Palestinian leaders. After meeting with Greenblatt, Abbas was quoted as saying that a historic peace deal under President Trump is possible, 
Last week, President Sisi urged the United States to help restart negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians, saying that it's important that the United States returns to play an active role in efforts to resume negotiations between the Palestinians and Israel. He went on to say that Trump agreed that the two-state solution is the only way to bring stability to the region. Sisi went on to suggest that he believes that the 2002 Arab Peace Initiative should serve as a basis for solving the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Hamas is furious at the Palestinian Authority for refusing to foot the bill for the electricity that Israel supplies to Gaza. The move could lead to a complete power shutdown in the territory, whose two million people already endure blackouts for much of the day. Ramallah announced its decision late last week, and now one spokesman for Gaza's Islamist rulers is threatening that both Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and Israel will regret the action. The PA's latest move is yet another sign that the faction is hardening relations towards its Hamas rivals, who seized control of the enclave in a bloody 2007 Palestinian civil war. The Western-backed authority and Hamas are now at a deadlock in their struggle over a unity deal. The PA is trying to pressure Hamas into agreeing to convene new Palestinian elections that could loosen the Islamist group's hold on the Strip. Israel stuck in the middle of the two warring factions since the Jewish state supplies electricity and fuel to Gaza. Jerusalem will only deal with Ramallah on the supply since Hamas is regarded as a terrorist organization. Most of the money Hamas collects in taxes is spent on rebuilding its military infrastructure ahead of the next confrontation with Israel. Desperation among the residents has been rising since the only power plant in Gaza stopped operating two weeks ago. رسالة للسلطة إنها تنظر لقطاع غزة بالمنظور الصحيح إنه قطاع غزة جزء لا يتجزأ من فلسطين يعني بوجه رسالة للرئيس محمود عباس إنه ينظر لا إحنا في قطاع غزة إنه إحنا شعبك يا رئيس أبو مازن وإحنا يعني إحنا جزء من فلسطين يا أبو مازن ويعني انظر لنا على الأقل بشفقة يعني Hamas officials are creating a lot of fanfare over the releasing of a revised policy statement that supports the establishment of a transitional Palestinian state along the 1967 lines and most shockingly drops the terror organization's long-standing call for Israel's destruction. The document was presented in Doha by Hamas leader Khaled Mashal as rulers of the Palestinian faction in Gaza watched the announcement on TV. Even though the hardline Islamist group claims that it somewhat softened its stance on Israel, Mashal says that Hamas continues to reject Israel's very right to exist and is committed to an armed struggle against the Jewish nation. <laughs> We shall not waive an inch of the Palestinian home soil, no matter what the recent pressures are and no matter how long the occupation. Hamas rejects any idea except liberating the home soil entirely and completely, although it does not necessarily mean we recognize the Zionist entity or give up any of our Palestinian rights. Hamas considers the establishment of a Palestinian state sovereign and complete on the basis of the June 4, 1967, with Jerusalem as its capital and the provision for all the refugees to return to their homeland is an agreeable form that has won the consensus among the movement members. The statement also includes claims that Hamas will end its association with the Muslim Brotherhood. This move is apparently aimed at improving ties with Gulf Arab states and Egypt, which view the Brotherhood as a terrorist group. Publication of the policy document comes just ahead of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas's visit to Washington tomorrow. Texas has just become the 20th state in the union to ban public entities from having any business with organizations boycotting Israel or the Israeli settlements. ILTV's Aaron Porras joins me in the studio with more. Aaron, tell us about this bill. Well, it was signed by Texas Governor Greg Abbott on Tuesday. Uh, and Abbott said, quote, you can always count on Texas. And I think that right now we definitely trust that statement given all the facts. 
Let's hear what else he had to say on the matter. Any anti-Israel policy is an anti-Texas policy. Texas is not going to do business with any company that boycotts Israel. I'm proud to have commemorated Israel's Independence Day by signing into law anti-BDS legislation in Texas." End quote. After praising the new measure, Charles Kaufman, the chair of Nabrith's International Center for Human Rights and Public Policy, told the Jerusalem Post that, quote, advocates of BDS would do well to learn from the robust business relationships Texas enjoys with the state of Israel. The path to peace is not through hatred, false narratives, boycotts, or terrorism. States like Texas won't fall for such nonsense, end quote. All right, I, like so many other people around the world, have a confession to make. I've got Bieber fever and finally had the chance to let out some of that energy at Justin Bieber's latest Israeli concert in Tel Aviv last night. ILTV's Aaron Porras has more on that story, though, because he happens to be a true believer himself. Aaron. <laughs> Hi, Natasha. It's okay. You, know, you can be honest with the viewers about how you feel about Justin Bieber. Some things should be kept a mystery. You know, some things should be kept a mystery. But I'll I tell thought you, we really had to share this, Aaron. I couldn't I hold suppose. it in. I suppose. But I'll tell you, it seems at the very least you are not the only believer as 50,000 fans poured into Ganea Yehoshua Park last night. They certainly for did. For his concert, yeah. Well, let's check out your report. Fans were so excited, in fact, that at least four concert goers were hospitalized, roughly 150 were treated by Magintavita Dome paramedics, and one woman went into labor. Most, however, were treated for minor issues like dehydration and fainting. The show was Bieber's first since 2011 when he was just 17 years old, and will be the only show in Israel while on tour promoting his latest album, Purpose. Later this year, the Jewish National State expects to be visited by Aerosmith, Rod Stewart, Tom Jones, Britney Spears, Guns N' Roses, Radiohead, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, The Pixies, and many, many more. Without a doubt, the most iconic photograph of the Six-Day War is the one of three Israeli paratroopers standing in awe of the recaptured Western Wall. Now, just ahead of the 50th anniversary commemorations of the 1967 Battle for Jerusalem, the trio have returned to the site to remember the momentous occasion. Tzion Karasenti, Chaim Oshri, and Dr. Itzik Yifat are now in their 70s. They say that they had no idea that their image would one day come to serve as a symbol of the nation, fulfilling a 2,000-year dream. The three former soldiers say they weren't even sure they'd really found the Western Wall since they'd never seen it before. Most Israelis had never been to the holiest site in Judaism since it had been captured by Jordan in 1948. During the war, the Israeli troops survived 48 straight hours of fighting by the time they made it into the old city. Even as they stood before the wall with tears in their eyes, it was still in the heat of battle with enemy forces all around. Sadly, the legendary photographer who preserved the moment forever, David Rubinger, passed away last month. All right, moving on, we want to treat our viewers to some of the most amazing images of Israel's aerial prowess ever filmed during the annual Independence Day flyover of the nation. Jet fighters, helicopters, transport planes, and other aircraft swooped 530 miles across the country in a festive display of Israel's military superiority. Many performed acrobatics in the skies above the capital of Jerusalem and other major cities including Tel Aviv, Haifa, and Beersheba. Without a doubt, one of the most exciting aspects was the public debut of five F-35s, which Israel only recently acquired. The Jewish nation is the only country in the world to possess the state-of-the-art fighter jet other than the United States. The Israeli pilots had the best seats in the house, so to speak. They say they loved being able to watch the entire nation of Israel celebrate its 69th birthday with barbecues and picnics at parks, beaches, and homes from the Negev Desert to the Sea of Galilee. One airman told reporters the crews were able to fly low enough at times so they could even see their joyous families and friends waving at them as they zoom by in the heavens above. That's it for this week's Roundup. Tune in next Friday for our next episode of This Week in Israel. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from Tel Aviv.